Hello everyone, I'm Henrietta Dupka from MDC and I'm your host of today's Tidbits. Uh, this is the third week where we are having our Tidbits, small pieces of delicious and interesting knowledge which are presented at, uh, from 12 to 12.30 every Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. Um, we didn't like all these long webinars, uh, just these small pieces and then we will invite some of our speakers to longer webinars at uh, when we, oh, to events when we are opening up again, hopefully very soon. I'm looking so much forward to doing the live uh, or IRL uh, events again. But uh, let's get started. I'm happy to present uh, today's dish here. It will be a uh, hamburger with uh, Philadelphia for my for my plate, at my plate. And I'm going to bring out a toast for today's webinar. Toast with Rasmus, toast with all of you out there. Thank you very much. I'm uh, going to welcome Rasmus Elsborg uh, from Reflow Maritime, who will be today's chef. And uh, Rasmus, he will serve you circular economy in understandable tidbits. Uh, I'm so much looking forward to this uh, this little uh, li this little uh, webinar myself because uh, I would like to understand a little bit better what Rasmus is doing. He is always out in a lot of events and uh, he's a very very popular speaker. So um, it's apparently something which we can uh, we can use for a lot of stuff where we can be more compatible. And uh, it's uh, it's a hidden tool in a crisis situation. So what's what's better in uh, getting started with understanding circular economy so we can apply it to our businesses? Rasmus, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, you very much, uh, Henrietta. Um, having a little bit feedback on the sound here. So um, let's see if there's something with um with the technical stuff here. Let's see. Still there? Hmm, that's strange. Okay, I'll just uh, go ahead, and then we'll we'll talk about um, the circular economy as a as a tool in the time of crisis. Um, we're gonna get, look at the agenda today. We're gonna uh, start our, our focus on what can we do as a supplier or ship owner uh, in regards to benefit from the circular economy. So that's some of the things we're gonna look at today. We have bit of a tight schedule. We only have 15 minutes for today. So I just did some uh, some small um, dive downs into some small areas. We're going to look at a model today. So today, um, circular economy has never been more important than it is right now. Um, it's, uh, it's really a, a big problem when we talk about um, um, the whole uh, COVID-19 crisis. Um, it's really a uh, a uh, big issue that that um, that has uh, affected everybody in the industry. Uh, we're seeing record um, small amount of um, uh, well, very low bunker prices, uh, which is uh, has pretty much halted many of the environmental sustainability projects that we have seen. Um, we have also seen other. Um, we've seen the whole new building industry with issues in regards to uh, no new buildings are actually uh, being done right now. So, um, so it's it's a big crisis. It has a lot of uncertainty both for the um, manufacturers but also for the ship owners around the world. But it's also um, when we have crisis, there is a chance to actually um, change what we're doing and uh, try and not do it business as usual. So, um, so. When we talk about circular economy, it's uh, it's a huge uh, it's a huge topic. So today we're going to focus on um, circular topic, uh, circular economy within the direct uh, application within the maritime industry. So we're gonna we're gonna sharpen our pencil and look at the maintenance of the vessels around the world. But that's that's where we can actually apply circular economy uh, in scale and actually do a difference. So when we talk about circular economy in general, there are three main areas or main uh, topics. Um, those are defined by Ellen MacArthur Foundation as the first one is design out waste and pollutants. Um, that has something to do with the product design of components and systems. It's important that we look at that. Um, the second one is key products and materials in use. And that's what we're gonna focus on uh, this short webcast today. 
And then the second or well, third one is to re regenerate natural systems. So, um, so that's, that's some of the things. But when we look at circular economy and its use in the maritime industry, we are an infant stage. If we compare it to other industries like aviation and automotive, we have a much higher adoption rate. Circular economy and specifically circular maintenance of the world's uh, the world merchant fleet is only in around uh, five to ten percent of the of the whole maintenance scope. Um, aviation is up to thirty to forty percent of the maintenance of the aviation uh, of the aircrafts around the world, and automotive is about uh, 40, 40 to uh, fifty percent. So uh, we have a lot of potential in the maritime industry, and that's what we're gonna look at today. Um, let's look at the uh, the slideshow or some slides I've prepared today. The first slide we're gonna look at is a model that I think is very beneficial. It's a model from Accenture where they try to look at the different business models and uh, and its application. So we have from the from the start, we have the product design. It is really important that we uh, that we focus on that and, and actually design products to last. Um, and then the sourcing, manufacturing, and so on. Today, the uh, the merchant fleet is maintained from a linear perspective. That means that uh, used components are being uh, discarded after use. That means the components that are keeping all the ships and systems running after X amount of time when they're worn out, they're being thrown out and new components are being sent from the manufacturers to the ships around the world. Now, in order to embrace circular economy, we need to focus on reusing as much as possible of these components. Um, and a very important term I want to introduce today is the word remanufacturing. Remanufacturing is a very, very important word and has a lot of uh, potential well implemented in the maritime industry. Uh, going away from just using new all the time, remanufacturing has the possibility um, to actually um, supplement the new production. Now, a remanufactured component is a uh, not a new component, it's a component that has been uh, disassembled and serviced by the manufacturer or service company and has the same capability and the same quality as a new component. So that is a really uh, important um, term to, to remember. Now, if we go back to our model here, we have all the stuff in the bottom with the highlighted in, uh, in blue. In this area here, we got the remanufacturing. We also have reselling. Now, reselling is where used components in the maritime industry are being sold to uh, secondary markets. That's called a cascading effect. Then when you uh, take a used component and then sell it, that could either be to another installation of maritime use or even to land-based applications. That could be a power generation. There is also a lot of attention on upgrading systems. Um, using upgrading uh, of systems, you're able to actually cut what's called direct emissions. And that's another important term we need to, uh, to look at here when we talk about circular economy. It is the difference between direct emissions and secondary emissions. The direct emissions is what we hear uh, in the industry in general when we hear about the vessel, uh, the vessel are cutting down its emissions. That's typically what's called direct emissions. That's emissions that are created when the engines are, um, are burning uh, fuel from its engines. Um, so that's the direct emissions. Now the secondary emissions are everything that um, is in regards to the ship's maintenance. So that could be the, the building of the vessel, but also the maintenance of the systems on board. Um, depending on how it's maintained, if you're just shifting out components with you, um, then you're keeping a high uh, CO2 footprint. But if you start looking at remanufacturing or other possibilities, then you have the option to really lower the carbon footprint on the secondary emissions of the vessels. Um, so repair and maintain, um, that has been done. Um, and that is also keeping the systems running, which is uh, another uh, a thing in the circular economy is if you can keep a system running as long as possible, you don't have to throw them out. Um, then uh, you're also um, keeping materials in the loop. Now, the really interesting part here is what's called as a service. And that is, uh, I brought some examples today that we're gonna look at. Um, and one of the examples is a product as a service. But that's really when you're offering a product, instead of offering the product in a sales transactional situation, you're offering um, the product as a, 
as what it's actually doing. So let's say that you're a manufacturer of vessel um, ship engines. And if you want to sell your product as a service, here you have the ability or the possibility to actually, instead of sell the engine, you can sell the propulsion of the vessel. Now, that, re that, that is totally game changer in the industry because now you're moving focus away from the product, but more on what it's doing. And that gives room for a lot of innovation in the, also in the maritime industry. So we're going to look at that a little bit later here. But uh, I'm going to, uh, yeah, so this is a really important uh, slide. I'm going to get back to that if you have any questions later. Okay, so let's look at the first example today when we have to understand circular economy and business opportunities. The first one is called sale on exchange basis. Um, I've made some thumbs up and thumbs down, some pros and cons, and I'm gonna go through them. That's based on our research and our um, information on the, on the subject. The first one is sales on exchange basis. So here, the manufacturer is selling either a new or remanufactured component and getting the used unit back. Now, the game changer here is that the used unit is then going to be remanufactured and put back in stock for the next customer. Now, doing the remanufacturing process, you're only exchanging components that are worn out and needs to be exchanged. Components that are not affected can be safely reused. Um, and that's going to create um, a CO2 footprint reduction, but also a cost reduction because you don't need to remanufacture a completely new unit. You only have to uh, use the, these different spare part kits that you use for remanufacturing. So we see a cost reduction with 30 to 50% compared to a new unit. Um, we again, with remanufacturing, you give the same warranty as new. Um, and our studies have shown that on some cases, we see a carbon footprint um, dropped by 95% compared to a new produced unit. And that's because in many scenarios, you're reusing all the, the um, environmentally heavy components. Now, um, what are the uh, downsides here, or the, cons the cons that we have to look at? That can be, re uh, that is return logistics. In the maritime industry, return logistics is, uh, is not a common practice. Um, here, we're used to just sending components out or systems out to a vessel and receiving the used unit back or sending that the first mile out from the vessel and back to the manufacturer. Uh, we don't see uh, many does not have any systems for that. So that's really important that we, uh, that we focus on return logistics. If we skip on to the next one here, we are taking a sharing economy approach. Um, that's also one of the aspects of, of circular economy is sharing resources or pooling resources. So this example is given where ship owners, they actually buy um, together a pool of uh, systems, units, or components that they all have in common. And by pooling the resources, they can swap these out throughout the lifespan of the vessel uh, in the, from this pool. And that can actually give you a cost reduction with up to 70%. So that's a huge, huge cost reduction that ship owners can benefit from right away. Now, the same warranty as new because many times it's remanufactured units or new uh, units. And again, if we're working with remanufacturing units, you're also going to see the same carbon footprint uh, drop as you would see normally. The uh, considerations here are availability issues. If you have unforeseen breakdowns, again, you have the uh, return logistics. Um, what is important here is to ensure traceability using some digital systems to also have track of the service history in, in this whole pool so all the ship owners know what are they actually getting when they're getting a remanufacturing units. Um, so there is some uh, risk, uh, risk management here and some quality assurance needs to be in order. Then we do a different one called product as a service. And this one is really interesting, but here you're now not selling a product anymore. You're actually selling the performance of the product. Um, and we see that being done successfully in other industries like the aviation industry, which is known as an asset light industry. That means that um, the aviation or the airlines does not own all the assets. Many times they're not own the aircraft engines themselves, they're very, very expensive. So these are actually before or rented out as a service. Now, depending on the setup with the manufacturer or the service provider, this can result in a up to 90% cost reduction. 
Um, you're also able to spread out the investment over your OPEX, so uh, your pairs you use uh, over time. Instead of you have to buy these, uh, you have these last expenditures whenever you have to exchange these units every time. Uh, main times it's uh, it's planned service, so it's a worry-free setup, also for the for the vessel operators. Now um, the contract periods can be long, which is a good thing for the manufacturers because it gives you more touch points with your customer. You also have the possibility to include different upgrade scenarios. You can always get the latest uh, version of our product by that renewing your obligation with the uh, with the shipping line. Now, doing this setup, uh, we see the requirement for IoT devices. So you really need to have some technology there to get the condition monitoring of the equipment. So that's uh, that's the obstacle there. Very good. So that's uh, a little bit about that. So where do we start? We have the ship owners. We have the manufacturing. What is really important when we talk circular economy is the mindset. We need to get around that new is not always better. If we manage our risk and we do it correctly, uh, remanufactured units can have the same quality and, and the same endurance as new units. Um, so what do you do as ship owners? Start with the low risk component groups. Um, contact your suppliers and your manufacturers and say, hey, do we offer this as an alternative? That could be after you already have the new unit installed from, from new on the vessel. The next service interval could be uh, swapped by a remanufactured unit or they can do some other cooperation with you. Uh, again, for ship owners, manufacturers, is focus on the return logistics. Uh, use different digital systems in order to manage that. Also, with the service history and and all the um, the information there, because you're gonna get a lot of different components on your vessels that might have uh, been used before. Uh, for the manufacturers, life cycle assessments and remanufacturing potential assessments are really important. Figuring out which of our components are, are more uh, are more um, beneficial to remanufacture than other, but also figure out what your environmental footprint is for this component, because that's the only way you can improve it is to figure out where you stand. Um, yeah, and we've also seen the cases where old legacy uh, products have been uh, swapped from selling new from the manufacturers to offer it as a remanufactured options. By that, um, these old legacy units might many times have a high marginal cost if you have to produce them from new because you have such small batches. Um, so here, by implementing remanufacturing or other uh, setups, you're able to lower the price substantially without affecting the quality. So you're still able to sell them. Um, and by that, you're able to uh, regain market shares because if your price is too high, we have a tendency to see uh, alternative providers, for example, in Asia, uh, grabbing some of your market shares. So that's really important. So um, that is 15 minutes. I know it's been very intense and very uh, high power, and that's totally on purpose because I want your lunch to be as entertaining as possible. And now I'm open for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rasmus. I'm putting you up on uh, the full screen now, and there are already a couple of questions that has come in. So I will start with this one here in the question part. We have uh, Ida who is asking, what barriers do you see for the maritime industry to implement circular economy? Yeah, I think um, what we need to focus on here is the, well, the maritime industry is one of the most uh, the regulated industries in the world after uh, aviation and communications. And, and therefore, there is some barriers with the whole legislation part of it. We have to set up with the classification societies. And the classification size is, um, or right now, as I see it, still in the infant stage of looking at remanufacturing, approving them for classified parts of the vessels. So that's really important. But other barriers is also, as I mentioned before, is the mindset of the uh, users, the ship owners, and the manufacturers. If the ship owners start creating a demand saying, this is where we want to go. We want to cut costs. We want to do something good for the environment while we go along. And then the manufacturers are going to start offering it. And then my experience say that then the legislation and all the rules are going to follow uh, afterwards. Good. So a little bit of uh, lobbying the classification societies must be uh, to, on the to-do list. Healthy rest. dialogue is really important, definitely. Yeah. Good. I have another question from uh, Pernil here. She is asking, you mentioned the need for digital tools. What tools are out there at the moment to handle this new approach? 
Uh, is that of your knowledge? Yeah. Um, again, circular maintenance and circular economy in the maritime industry is is still um, is still in the infant stage. So what what we have seen is that there are different systems focusing on the maintenance uh, of the vessels, and there are other systems um, that could be Satica or Shipnet that's focusing on the maintenance of the vessels. And then there are logistic systems focusing on return logistics, uh, going back and forth. And then we have other systems focusing on the um, manufacturer side. But right now, um, there are very few systems that are incorporating all these different elements into one. Um, we, we, are, we are developing right now and have some pilot tests right now with a system that incorporates um, this tracking service history and return logistics. Uh, but there is not many out there. So it's a, it's a really good question. Uh, Rasmus, just a curiosity. What about the huge players on like uh, ship engines as uh, uh, Batsila? Are they working in their circular economy in some of their solution? And I also think about the, um, what you say, to sell the engine as a service, not as a product. Do you know that? Yeah, I, I can't comment specifically on what Vatila is doing, but I can see a, t a trend that um, that the large manufacturers are looking into circular economy, not calling it circular economy, but more, more on a, more on a, more on a setup, more on a product services where they're remanufacturing uh, certain components that could be, yeah, certain engine components, uh, but they're not going out to offer it. And I think that can also be, you don't want to uh, cut off the, in Danish you say, cut off the branch you're sitting on. You don't want to, you don't want to ruin uh, your bread and butter. Um, so, so I see that it's still, it's not a mainstream thing, circular economy. Good. I have another couple of questions. Um, next one is from uh, Jörn Clausen. I'm reading up. Built to last, okay, but ships can last for 25 to 30 years or more and will probably spend more than 50% of its life being outdated. Can built to last also be, for instance, eight years and thereby ensure more modern vessel uh, on as constant basis and then reflow would make sense? Yeah, um, I, I think it's a very good question. What we are seeing right now is the problem is you have on the vessels, they are all built um, customized. So we see even though you're building series of vessels, they are built to spec. So we don't have any standardized approach to shipbuilding. And by that, we don't have a standardized approach to the systems being on board. Many of them are created based on the specifications of the, uh, of the builder or the owner. So we need to move away from the more um, <clears throat> customized shipbuilding into a more standardized design. If we can do that, we can create modular uh, approaches to the systems on board, and that will, and then it will make sense to actually change the outdated systems and upgrade them to new as you go along, because the whole design uh, have pretty much been the same for many years. Of course, there's been improvements. But, uh, but if the hull design is the same, we can then shift the modular systems on board the vessels. And that would, uh, that would definitely uh, bring some new business opportunities. This is one thing I have always been wondering. Even sister ships can be different, but why? I mean, it's, yeah. uh, it's really a big question mark in my, in, in my mind, on my mind, with why, why, why? Mm -hmm. it, it, and even many of the like tankers, they are all built on the same, um, how do you say, same module, uh, but they are still very different from uh, from ship to ship. So I don't know how the standardization will, will come up, but I really hope that it will come up now. Um, we have a lot of questions coming up, Rasmus, so I will hurry, hurry okay. along to yep. Celeste Hornby. She says, she's writing, product as a service. We buy the service, not the product, okay? Pool sharing, a sort of shared economy, but sale on exchange basis. Could you give a short explanation on yeah. that? Please? So basically the sale on exchange basis is where the user, the vessel operator or the vessel is, um, is buying a remanufactured or a new component. They get that from the from the service provider, whoever they buy from, they get it on the vessel. And then they buy that with a reduced cost, um, agreeing to actually ship 
the used unit back because the manufacturer or whoever they buy from have um, have uh, what could you say procedures in place where they can reuse the um, the component again and by that you're uh, you are working with the circular economy by reusing components uh, it's a very simple approach it just takes uh, the whole remanufacturing to follow in but you need the old unit back in order to re remanufacturing you need the core unit and um, Celeste, she's also asking, um, what effect do you think or fear uh, that the current corona crisis could have on circular economy? I think um, the crisis now has us all talking cost. We need to cut cost um, and we need to stay more competitive. That's both as a manufacturer, but also as a ship operator. So actually, I think the Corona crisis will create opportunities for many uh, manufacturers to change some of their business models to say, okay, we have experienced a Corona crisis. We also experienced that our dependency of sub suppliers, for example, in Asia has affected our ability to deliver our products. So by implementing uh, circular economy models, we uh, then cut a little bit off this dependency by working on some of our products on a remanufacturing basis. So I see it as a huge opportunity. This was also what the, the title of this uh, little tip it is that it's the, it's the hidden tool of crisis periods. Well, it's, um, there are a lot of questions here, Rasmus. So I have one more and this one okay. is from Brian. You mentioned the air and auto um, automobile industries as comparisons. Can you give us some example of areas in those industries where circular economy is particularly active? Very good question, uh, Brian. Yeah, uh, for the aviation industry, circular economy uh, remanufacturing is very active within the engines. So um, aviation engine is very, very expensive, very, very complex. So uh, they. So, for example, there is a company called Satair, and Satair has uh, it's a uh, it's a company that have specialized within remanufacturing of these aircraft engine components. Um, so that would be in regards to the engine. If we look at the engines in the and the systems in the automotive industry, um, a producer like Renault, they have a dedicated plants in France that are remanufacturing core components that have been. Uh, taking out of faulty uh, systems and then selling them back to their dealer network. So when you when you get a car repaired, they're selling it as a new component, but often it is a remanufactured component, and you will not know the difference. Cool. I remember in old times when I was living in Italy, you could go to uh, Scott Pleasant and there you could find the, the, the component you, you needed for your car. So that was a, a very basic kind of, uh, of recycling or circular economy. And now yeah, just exactly. That's reusing it. components. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you found another Saab and then they took it out and sold it for you to ah, 200 euro. Yeah, take it. <laughs> I have a last question here because we need to um, to stop exactly at uh, twelve thirty, as we have a, um, a clean shipping uh, the, the business of clean shipping conference coming up at one o'clock. I'll put the link in uh, in the chat so you can uh, so you can link on to that one. Many of you, you I know that you are following on to that. So one last question. Uh, this is from Ida. Uh, often when we talk about sustainable approaches, there is a big gap between economic growth and sustainable solutions. Can you comment a bit on the economic growth factors uh, with circular economy? Yeah, I think circular economy is very interesting when we talk about economic growth. Well, you, you actually have the ability to cut cost on the, on the user side, on the vessel operators, but on the manufacturers, you're opening up a whole new market. You are able to regain some of the lost markets on the legacy side that will create more business, but also the remanufacturing uh, process will create jobs, especially in the beginning until you automated the remanufacturing procedures. It will actually be um, a fairly manual operation, um, but you're creating high value. So it's also suited to be done, for example, here in Denmark. I know several companies in Denmark which have uh, many people uh, Hire that are only doing remanufacturing work. 
So it is possible. It is possibly also in the uh, in the high uh, salary countries. Um, we also have a whole new market with the return logistics. That's going to create more logistics, even though it's return. It's still going to be um, a business that's going to going to grow. Um, you're also saving materials. So you will see a little bit drop in the virgin material production, but you will see a high um, high growth within the used materials. So um, so that will definitely be something that will create jobs and, and economic growth. Rasmus, I think we have to ask you uh, to ask you to join us for a tidbit uh, in an, in another another day because it's uh, popping in with questions. There is a lot of questions and a huge interest for the topic, but unfortunately, we have to uh, to close down uh, the tidbit for today. So uh, I will for sure invite you um, perhaps in a month or so. So. Uh, uh, we are going to, uh, I've put in the chat now the conference uh, where I know also Rasmus is attending as a, um, as a guest. Uh, it's about the, the business of Klee. Uh, yeah, it's there. And also Rasmus, he has just put up his uh, contact information such as um, email and um, LinkedIn. Do feel free to ask the questions to him and um, and link in with uh, with Rasmus. He's putting up a uh, very often some very nice posts about circular economy. So uh, thank, thank you very much for sharing your time with us and sharing your knowledge about uh, circular economy. I, I I got I got more insight in it, and I'm sure also some of the other more than 30 people who attended got this insight. Um, for now, I want to thank all of you for for joining this tidbit. If um, if you uh, want to join next week, I can um, reveal that it will be about the new report from from the Center of Cybersecurity um, statements. If the ratings changed, uh, they made a report uh, which will be which has been published but not really spoken about. And we will have Bjorn Borby uh, to tell about that on Tuesday. And on Wednesday, we will have. Lorenz technology telling about the potential of uh, drones in the maritime industry. So also two very, very interesting uh, topics for next week. Um, thank you so much for joining us and we hope to see you another day and have a wonderful day. And thank you to Rasmus. Thank you very again. much. Thank you everybody Bye -bye. for watching. Bye-bye.